I'm Tim Ventura, and in this presentation, Dr. Kent Peacock will be discussing his recent paper, Fermi and Latka, The Long Odds of Survival in a Dangerous Universe, which argues that the great filter resolution to the Fermi paradox wouldn't be a single factor, but rather simply the statistics of survival in an always dangerous universe. Dr. Peacock suggests that the frequency of species that survive multiple existential threats would likely obey a power law such as Latka's law. Dr. Peacock is a professor of philosophy at the University of Lethbridge and is a philosopher of science focused on physics and ecology. He also has strong interests in the metaphysics of time, logic, environmental ethics, the nature of ingenuity and creativity, and the complex nature of challenges flowing out of humanity's current ecological crisis. So <clears throat> where are they, Fermi, Latka, and the long odds of survival in a dangerous universe? And I guess that's kind of my real theme here, is that all evidence suggests we live in a very dangerous old universe, and, and um, we need to be very aware of that fact. But it, it'll cash out in a particular way. And again, um, I'm not an astrobiologist, that's for sure. I'm a philosophy prof, specialized in philosophy of science, philosophy of physics, environmental issues, logic. Um, and um, But I've been interested in these, these issues for a very long time and have given a bit of thought to it. So um, even though this is, I'm not really an astrobiologist, um, this, let's call this an extra, maybe this is an exercise in philosophy of astrobiology. So if we define astrobiology sort of ironically as the attempt to draw broad conclusions about the nature of life in the universe on the basis of a sample size of one, <laughs> which does not lead necessarily guarantee good statistics. And this, so, so something is speculative. This is good, a good topic for a philosopher. Okay, so we have this thing called Fermi's paradox, which is a contradiction between the very high likelihood that life else, there is life elsewhere in the universe and the fact that we have not yet reliably detected it. And I will talk about UFOs and things like that in a minute because the key is this word reliably. So I, what I wanna do is outline a very, very tentative scientific hypothesis. People who know statistics and better than me should could study it further. But, um, and I wanna talk about why, why this is actually an important problem. And um, my, I was lucky enough to get my idea published in um, this journal called British Journal of the British Interplanetary Society back in 2018. Uh, my article is called Fermi and Locke, The Long Odds of Survival in a Dangerous Universe. And they were actually publishing a special issue on the Fermi problem. And luckily I submitted my paper at exactly the right time and uh, th they thought it was interesting. So it's in there. So uh, there's the reference if anybody wants to look it up. Or you can, you can um, email me and I can send it to you as well. Okay, so first, uh, the first scientific principle we're going to work with here is what I'll call Adam's Law, it's named after Douglas, the late, great uh, Douglas Adams of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Adam's Law, space is big. <laughs> you just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. All right, and um, I mean, it's, it's um, well, I was listening to your, your interview with Omri Wandel just last night, which is, was really interesting. I think he made the same point that we just have to wrap our mind around. Well, it's impossible for us to fully grasp the dimensions. So here's an illustration of Adam's law. I mean, most people have seen this. This is a, called the Hubble Deep Field or Ultra Deep Field. Um, it, it's an image of 10,000 galaxies running from one to probably over 10 billion light years distant. And what they did was they exposed the Hubble telescope for a total of, I think, 11.3 days, aiming at a small patch of sky uh, that was apparently just black to the naked eye, nothing there. And when you um, expose the, the, the camera long enough, this is what you see, thousands and thousands of galaxies. Obviously, the ones that are sort of orange and red are the ones that are red shifted so they're farther away they're they're participating in the so-called hubble flow and they're they're quite a long distance away and um you know you're you're looking at how many stars right so each galaxy typically contains 
10 to 11 to 10 to 12 stars. Current estimate that I've seen, there, there are roughly two, two trillion galaxies within the observable universe. And that's only the observable universe because with the expansion of the universe, there's a horizon beyond which we can't really see what's out there. So there could, there could be vastly more. And I've seen the comment um, that, oh, this is just wallpaper. It's just irrelevant. It's just like a, a backdrop to pr pretty lights in the sky, which are a backdrop to our uh, the important things that we do down here on Earth. Um, or you could take the attitude that, as I say, this is a window onto a vast reality. And certainly the latter viewpoint is more interesting to me. <laughs> so, and I think it's, I and I would say that um, ultimately for our survival as a species, we have to take the second viewpoint. We have to see ourselves as part of this vast reality, even though it's a little scary to some people. I, I have a good friend, very literate and well-educated friend, who's uncomfortable looking at the stars at night, just freaks it. They just, he can't do it. He doesn't deny that it's real. He just uh, too scared. So, so um, now to add to all of this, we now know from recent work in astronomy that there, there are exoplanets, a heck of a lot of exoplanets defined as planets outside our solar system, even though before 1992 or thereabouts, they're, their existence was only hypothetical. Um, but I just checked with Wikipedia a few weeks ago. Uh, they say as of September 1st this year, there are over 5,000 confirmed exoplanets and undoubtedly kajillions more of them. So a lot of them would not be inhabitable by life as we understand it. But Wikipedia says, uh, well, there are people who, they're just quoting people who have recently done the math on this. It can be hypothesized that there are 11 billion potentially habitable Earth-sized planets in the Milky Way alone. Multiply that by the total number of galaxies. So it only exacerbates Fermi's problem. It just makes it worse, right? Okay, so who is Fermi? So here's Enrico Fermi, a very distinguished Italian-American physicist, um, Nobel Prize for his discoveries in nuclear physics. He made many contributions to basic quantum theory, nuclear and particle physics, statistical mechanics. There's a thing called Fermi-Dirac statistics, which is a fundamental concept in quantum mechanics. Um, and uh, Fermi, very, very highly respected by his colleagues. He, he um, <clears throat> supervised con uh, construction of the, of the first uh, nu working nuclear reactor and then was closely involved in the Manhattan Project. And later on, Opposed creation of the hydrogen bomb, however, feeling it was too dangerous. And the interesting thing about Fermi, he was uh, famed for his ability to do extremely accurate back of the envelope calculations or guesstimates, which he usually did in the working context when he was working in the laboratory. But there's a, there's a sort of a, a story that, as a challenge, he once correctly estimated the number of piano tuners in Chicago from first principles. And then they looked it up in the phone book and discovered, well, of course, he was right. So I guess he went from, you know, number of households, number of households that have a piano, number of times a piano has to be tuned, that, that kind of thinking. And somehow he, he nailed it. So he just had, a, he, so when Fermi made a, a numerical guesstimate, uh, people took it very seriously. So anyway, many people will know this story that su supposedly, well, actually, this is actually not just an apocryphal tale. It's it's actually well verified. In back in 1950, Fermi and a number of colleagues were sitting around a lunch table at Los Alamos National Labs, talking about UFOs. And um, the reason what prompted them apparently was they had just seen this New Yorker cartoon by Alan Dunn. And so, what's going on in this cartoon it says DSNY, uh, uh, Department of Sanitation of New York. So. For some reason, nobody knows why, um, somebody was stealing um, garbage cans in the city of New York. And so the cartoonist is imagining here that the, the aliens are, are abducting the garbage cans for their own inscrutable purposes, right? So that was the point of the cartoon. So Fermi and his friends got sort of talking about this and then um, Fermi suddenly, suddenly said, oh, where are they? And apparently everybody immediately knew what he was talking about. And he'd done one of his favorite famous quick guesstimates 
uh, and estimated the probability that we should have been contacted by now, and it comes out to be a near certainty. And yet, at that point, they took it as obvious that there is no reliable evidence of alien intelligence. So that led to the question, where are they? Now, Leo Szilard, uh, one of the group of brilliant Hungarian scientists and mathematicians at the time said, well, they are among us, but disguised as Hungarians. So, um, but it's interesting to look into the historical background of this conversation. And there's an author named R.R. R. Martin, who's got an article on this in the same issue on PJ uh, J Jabez. Uh, so they know that this lunch party included Fermi himself, Edward Teller, Konopinski, and York. Um, these are all high-ranking atomic scientists, and definitely, certainly, with especially Teller himself, who was in the, in the thick of everything there, insiders at Los Alamos. So it raises the question of what did they really know? Because one of the, one of the speculations that some people have explored is that um, by around 1950 or even earlier, Los Alamos may have had possession of crashed alien craft or even bodies. And, well, maybe they did. But what I would like to suggest is that if Fermi and his friends had known this, if, if they knew there was such compelling evidence of an alien presence, their, their thus discussion and his question would have had no point. Um, and if Teller had known something, he would have kept very quiet. But in fact, Teller was later quoted as saying, quote, we talked about flying saucers and the obvious statement that the flying saucers are not real. So um, if so, I'm just guessing this is just purely an uns unsubstantiated guess. The very fact that Fer Fermi framed the problem this way suggests that if Los Alamos had, or a related agency had alien crash debris, these four scientists did not know about it because otherwise their conversation would have made no sense. That doesn't prove anything, but it's just an interesting thought. But let's get back to the, the, issue, the issue. So there's a thing called the Drake-Seeger equation. This has been worked on by uh, astronomy named Sarah Seeger, as well as Drake. And um, the details of Fermi's calculation are lost. He probably just jotted something down on a placemat. Um, but Frank Drake, and then more recently, uh, Canadian, uh, or an astrophysicist, Sarah Seeger, have further developed this. And, and the essential, everybody knows the essential idea is you, you just take into account the huge number of stars, the fact that there have been at least three generations of stars since the Big Bang, the probable number of Earth-like planets in our galaxy alone, and it seems hard to understand why they are not already here. And remember, in 1950, uh, there was no confirmation of exoplanets. Some astronomers actually thought that planets might be extremely rare. And now we know planets are extremely common. So again, it only makes the problem worse. So, so um, here's Frank Drake himself, who recently passed away. Um, there's his famous Drake equation. Now, I'm not going to get too much into the particulars of the equation, but I just thought I should put it up here. And I think it's important to realize that I don't think Drake <clears throat> or anybody means this equation to be um, some kind of law of nature. It's, it's almost, it's just basically like a shopping list of the quantities we need to understand in order to answer Fermi's question. So, um, sorry, my camera's a little screwy there. So, so, um, so, so and, and of course, people are working on trying to come up with reasonable guesstimates, but as, as um, your, uh, Amory Wandel said, some of these quantities vary by a factor of a billion. Uh, depending on your particular theory you explore. So this is extremely uncertain at this point. Um, again, N is supposed to be the number of civilizations in our galaxy that we should be able to communicate with. Okay, so now here's something that I, that, that I think gives us some guide. So consider the probability of advanced life versus microbes. So, so we say there's 11 billion roughly Earth-like planets just in our galaxy, if that's correct. Um, if our planet is typical, one would argue simple life might be common, but complex life is rare. And here's why. So on our planet, very simple life, as far as we know, appeared something over, it, very likely something over 3 billion years ago. 
Um, they're not sure of the exact figure, but there is there are biosignatures going back in, in rocks more than 3 billion years old. So basically, life appeared on our planet in a sense almost as soon as the it had cooled down enough to allow for um, liquid water. And bang, all of a sudden you've got life. Now, whether it or, or originated on Earth by some process that we still don't fully understand, or whether it was seeded from outer space, the concept of panspermia. I mean, that, that's really an interesting concept. We just don't know. Uh, Fred Hoyle and, and Narlikar have advanced that idea. Um, it's not a stupid idea by any means, but we just don't know. It's a really interesting question. But we do know, okay, life appeared very, very early on the earth. And we know that there are so-called bacteria um, or extremophiles, which can live in very extreme temperatures of, of temperature, radiation, salinity, um, that would destroy complex life like us. So life, so very simple life can appear very quickly and it can survive very, very extreme conditions. And so whereas um, advanced life, such as J.S. Bach, is very recent. So Homo, Homo sapiens has existed for only about roughly, say, 10 to the minus four of the time that life has existed on Earth. And um, so it so so maybe if this is correct, lots and lots of planets might have at least start out with microbial life, but it's very hard for them to get to the point where you have high levels of neurological complexity, such as J.S. Bach, as an example. So um, then there's uh, everybody knows about SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Uh, this is the search for radio signals in what we might call reasonable portions of the spectrum. Basically, it's batting exactly zero so far, despite a lot of effort and then many, many signal scanned. Um, whereas our own radio emissions by now would have spread out about 100 light years or so. And it's kind of funny to think that 50 years, you know, 50 to 60 light years away, um, if somebody could pick up our signals, they'd be seeing, you know, Ozzy and Harriet and leave it to Beaver out there somewhere. If, although my guess is a lot of those signals would be attenu attenuated so much, they're probably not detectable, but I'm not a radio engineer. But, but astronomers estimate our very best scopes could probably pick up signals from at least several hundred light years out if they were strong enough. So this leads to a, a phrase that a number of people use, the great silence. Where are they? And, you know, we keep working on it, and maybe there's bands of the spectrum that we haven't scanned yet, and so forth. So this is still a work in progress. But so far, it's disappointing. There's nothing. So with that, we have to talk about UFOs or UAPs. Now, this is a very large discussion, which I can't do justice to here. The professional community of astrobiologists, by and large, as far as I know, does not take them seriously. They hold that no reports of UFOs are reliable enough to be taken as conclusive evidence. And there's, there's a recent book by Adam Frank, who is a real astrobiologist, who said, quote, Fermi's question was not aimed at UFOs. That topic was and continues to be a morass of weak reasoning, poor observations, fakery, and conspiracy theories. So it's just not a serious proposition as far as Adam Frank was concerned in 2018. Um, now, so what I did in, in my paper, I, I essentially took it just as a working hypothesis that, yeah, this is right. There's no reliable evidence. That doesn't mean there's no evidence, but there's no evidence that everybody can yet agree on. And I'm very, very well aware that this could be wrong. I mean, I, I follow UFOs. I follow you. The whole discussion, and uh, I know about the intelligence report that came out uh, in 2021. Um, I get that. So I think that um, what I would say is is the subject of UAPs need, deserves to be taken seriously. It's going to turn out it's not going to make a lot of difference to the main conclusion of my argument anyway. But there's a question when you talk about th this. There's a there's a question of what I'm going to call burden of proof. All right, so 
I mean, as you know, this comes up in, in uh, you know, legal arguments and, and also in scientific arguments. So C Carl Sagan famously rejected UFO reports as genuine, saying extraordinary client claims require extraordinary evidence. So he wanted to set the bar very, very high for um, claims of UFO sightings. But one can ask, is there not an element of circularity in this reasoning? So suppose somebody says, you could not have seen an alien spacecraft because there are no such things. Well, well, why do you think there are no such things? Well, because there's no good evidence. So you, you, you've, you're reasoning, you're, you're at risk of reasoning in a circle here. And um, one of the big problems is we tend to discount reports of UAPs because they seem to violate our laws of physics. So for example, pilots report these things apparently doing undergoing accelerations that would simply vaporize any of our aircraft that we know how to build, right? And so what, what do you make of that? So one point you could keep in mind is if Fermi's reasoning was any good, would that not suggest that we should expect to see alien craft? And if so, should we not allow some benefit of the, benefit of the doubt to reports from reliable witnesses such as professional pilots? Right? And then the other thing we should we should keep in mind is, you know, should we not be open to the possibility that our present understanding of physics may not be quite right, that perhaps we still have some things to learn about physics. Um, so so you could you could read this two ways. So you see a UAP doing something that we judge to be physically impossible. So you could say, oh, well, that means that the report was no good. It's not to be taken seriously or you could say perhaps it means we need to learn some new physics right and um i'm willing to look at it both ways so particularly the second way i've done a lot of work in the foundations of physics as well and and um i won't get into it now but i i, I think there's some pretty serious gaps in our present physical understanding okay so moving on to uh back to fermi's problem so um there's an economist named Robin Hansen who proposed the concept of what he called the great filter. This has received a lot of discussion in this literature. So the idea of a great filter is there's some mysterious factor. It might be some kind of astronomical factor such as gamma ray bursts or something, or maybe just a statistical factor that wipes out all potentially advanced species before they could reach the stage of being detectable. And and so, yeah, even though many, many planets could possibly evolve life, something wipes them all out before they get beyond, much beyond our present stage of technical, technological development. And so Hansen and Bostrom have argued that if we, if we were to find evidence of ETs now, say we found, I don't know, a crashed spaceship on the backside of the moon or something, if we found evidence of ETs now, that would be very worrisome because it would be evidence that the great filter has not yet finished acting and we should be more worried because if we found no evidence of ETs anywhere, no signals, no debris, no nothing, um, then, and, and yet we're still, we still exist, well, maybe we're just the one incredibly lucky species that's dodged the bullet, right? And it's kind of strange reasoning, but, um, you know, uh, it is an interesting point. So, Thinking about what what a, what a great filter could be, um, and some other reading I was doing led me to, to to suggest that the great filter, if there is a great filter, is some is what's called Lotka's law, and uh, which is something that never ceases to operate. So now I'm going to try and explain to you what I mean by Lotka's law. So, okay, so Alfred J. Lotka. Um, was a distinguished American mathematical biologist, uh, made important contributions to the theory of population dynamics and evolution. So if you study um, quantitative uh, population ecology, there's things called the Lotka-Volterra equations that describe the sort of give and take between predators and preys, prey. Um, and back in 1926, Lotka amused himself by doing a study of the statistics of scientific publication. <laughs> so back in those days, there are no computer databases, of course. So he had to look through, but there were published paper databases of 
subjects like chemistry and biology, physics, and you know who was publishing what. And Locke patiently winnowed through these databases and compiled the statistics. And what he found, interestingly, is that there's an inverse relation between the number of papers published and the number of people publishing them. So a very small number of scientists are publishing most of the papers. So you get a few extraordinarily productive, let's say, chemists who are publishing three, four, 500 papers in their career, a whole bunch of chemists who publish one or two papers, a whole bunch of chemists who publish nothing in their career. And um, so when you compile this into a curve, you, you get this famous Lotka curve or the Lotka plot, which is basically a hyperbola. It looks like this. And just by playing with the numbers, he showed it, it approximately obeys an equation, x to the alpha f of n equals c. So n is the number of publications. Um, f is the frequency or percentage of authors with n publications. And alpha is an em empirical constant roughly equal to 2. And c, don't worry about c. It's just a normalization content constant. But the important point is f of n goes as 1 over alpha. Right? So um, as uh, n is higher, alpha f of n drops very, very quickly in this kind of. So again, lots and lots of people are publishing one or two papers. Very, very few people are are publishing um, um, 10 or more papers. And this curve just keeps on going. It's very important to realize this is this is not, a, again, uh, not a scientific law. It's a, it's a description of the statistics. And um, the, this so-called power law behavior seems to be um, a very, very wide occurrence in nature. It's a property of so-called complex systems, so very smart people like Per Back have studied it. Other mathematicians and physicists have studied this. Um, I've looked into some of the literature. Some of it's beyond me mathematically. But the sense I can pick up is that there is, still is not really, I would say, a completely satisfactory understanding of why some physical systems and biological systems obey th th these kinds of power laws. But we can take it that... Um, and I just may be showing my my ignorance there, but um, but it, the important point is it's a very very widespread phenomenon. So, for example, um, and in particular, what I notice is, is a, there's a, quite a number of situations in which you you'll get power laws like this applying to many different situations. So, fighter pilot kills, um, citations of publications and artwork. So, there's a book by Charles Murray where he goes through and cites. And, and compiles the numbers on things like how many times does an author get cited? How many times is a musician like Beethoven mentioned? Um, how many times is a particular artwork cited? And these numbers tend to follow power laws. Again, now they don't always, just going back, this the alpha here, it doesn't always come out to exactly two. It's kind of two-ish. It's kind of in that that region. But for different subject matters, you get slightly different values of alpha. But the overall form of the curve is this lock curve. Business bankruptcies, golf tournament wins, PGA golfers. You know, th th you know, there's three or four golfers like, you know, Tiger Woods and Jack Nicklaus and Ar Arnold Palmer, who won an enormous number of tournaments. And then uh, hundreds and hundreds of golfers who won maybe one or two tournaments or none, right? So so um, now what struck me is, is um, at least these examples here are, are distinguished by their, their kind of binary nature. You're either cited or you're not. Your article is published or it's not published. If, you, if you're in a dogfight, you get shot down or you don't. And, um, and so these are kinds of win-lose situations, golf tournaments. Um, you win the tournament or you don't. Now they've set up the structure of professional golf so that people who play say 10th can still earn enough money to stay in the tournament. They don't nobody they don't get killed, you know, but 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 to actually win, it's it's win or lose. You're at, you're either at the top or you're not. So I I thought I'd take it as a tentative hypothesis that these kinds of win-lose situations um 
may follow some kind of Lotka like power law. So let's see how we can apply this to the Fermi problem. So let's call this the mathematics of survival in a dangerous universe. So if you think of species evolving on planets all over the place, and maybe this happened, maybe the early life is very, very common on all these billions of Earth-like planets. They're, they're, they're going to be subject over and over and over again to existential threats. There's going to be something that will threaten their survival or at least their ability to attain high complexity. And it could be all kinds of things. And later on, I'll talk about some possible survival threats. But in the early stages, these would be things that are mostly physical, like um, climate issues, um, solar instabilities, impacts, um, who, who knows what else, the vul volcanism, th things that would threaten life. But the important point is that any such existential threat, it's it's a little bit like winning or losing a golf tournament. It's binary. If you if you pass, if you get past the threat, you go on. You're still in the game. If you don't, you're out of the game probably permanently. Right. So my suggestion was that that if you look at many, many species arising on many, many, many worlds, that overall the statistics of long-term survival of existential threats would look like a power law. So you'd have many, maybe you start off with an enormous number of species on an enormous number of planets, but in the end, not very many make it through all those existential threats to the point where they can attain high complexity and you know, make themselves noticed on, on an interstellar scale. So um, there would be, if Locke's law or, or any kind of power law applies, very, very few players would make it through. So, um, so we would be, it would be very, the probability of advanced, say, life, say, capable of, you know, Bach like complexity or higher, um, that probably might be very, very small, even if life arises on many, many worlds. So, this is the essential idea. And, um, it's it's just a all it really is is a guess about the the, the shape of the curve, the call it the survival curve. <laughs> I, I haven't made any attempt to guess the number of crises that a species could be expected to face, or how often they would occur. They they wouldn't come at regular intervals. They, well, again, they're, they're, the well certainly the people have found that the severity of um, extinction crises on the earth again follows a power law distribution right so there's lots and lots and lots of little existential crises but very very big extinct extinctions again uh, they're governed by a power law so um it's quite possible that there could, there could be a relatively benign planet where there's a species such as ourselves might be alerted to a false sense of security by say a 10,000 year period of relatively benign ecological uh, conditions and um you know some people think that's exactly what we where we are now we've gone through a period called the holocene roughly ten thousand years in length which you know it's had some bad weather to be sure but compared to the previous few hundred thousand years uh it was very very stable and benign and so such a species might develop what you might call ecological indolence um they get lazy they would think that um, these nice conditions were always going to continue, which might not be a good assumption. So, um, but the thing about Locke's law, so it sort of acts a bit like Hansen's great filter, but it doesn't act all at one time. It's just a statistical factor that just keeps going on and on. Um, now, the question is, if I'm right, right, does this solve the Fermi problem? Be not necessarily, because any solution to the Fermi problem is necessarily probabilistic or statistical. You're never going to be able to totally rule out the possibility that there are advanced aliens out there somewhere. Like, you, you can never totally rule that out. So, um, I mean, the very best we might be able to do if we knew more of the numbers 
is put some kind of rough upper bound on the probability that we would encounter a galactic competent civilization. And I know that's a lot of astrobiologists have been trying to do that math. But there's always a possibility, however small, that a highly competent species could keep dodging crises and sort of slip through the, the Lotka filter, right? So, so one way this could be tested if somebody wanted to is, well, of course, if someday we get a get warp drive working, um, we can go out and see. But um, until we're there, another thing you could do is is do computer simulations. So, and it would go essentially what you'd do is um, assume that potentially advanced life can rise at a certain rate within a large volume of stars. Assume that each planet is subject to survival challenges at some roughly constant average rate. See how many species survive in challenges. Now, personally, I don't have the the computer skills to do this, but this is something that people could could do. It. It's a, a way of framing the Lotka problem. And it would be really interesting to see where if you, if you did a realistic simulation, whether in fact you would see this kind of power law behavior. I'm just putting it forward again as a hypothesis. Um, be interesting to see how it cashes out. A couple of further cautionary implications to all of this. So I don't agree with Hansen and Bostrom. I think that we should actually be glad if we find ETs. Uh, not only because it would be extremely interesting, but because that means there's a better chance that life can survive the lot could filter. Um, but um, something we should be aware of is any technologically advanced ETs that we could encounter would probably come from very far out on the right hand side of the lot could curve. They would have been, they would have formidable survival capabilities. They would have had to, they have to be pretty tough dudes, right? So even if they have no hostile intentions towards us, um, they should be treated with the greatest caution and respect. So in particular, Air Force pilots should probably not lob Sidewinder missiles at the first UAP they see. Just a suggestion. Okay, okay so may, now another sort of footnote to this story is maybe there's something that you could call a threshold of competence in the universe. So. So maybe if a species, assuming it would be very important that the species is capable of learning, right? But the longer it survives, the greater its probability of further survival. So, so I mean, you can see this in things like going back to the golf example. See, the golf example is is relevant in a way because it's simple. Win or lose, you know, success in professional golf is something that is an individual matter. It's not a team sport. And, and so you can sort of isolate player by player and see how well they do. And, and, um, and we know that some, some young players, as they learn, they get better with time. And, um, you know, they, once they get onto the lot could curve into a good, they, they have, they sort of increase their probability of staying on it. Right. So maybe there's a threshold of competence. I mean, just to use the <clears throat> golf example again, let's, let's imagine Tiger Woods in his prime. Uh, was um, playing a tournament on a very easy par three course, right? He's probably going to run the table, so to speak. It's going to be too easy for him. It will not pose a significant challenge. But yeah, he might flub the occasional shot, but he's going to do really, really well. And and so maybe we just don't know. We simply don't know. But maybe it's the case that a sufficiently technologically and intelligent advanced and intelligent species would not find significant survival challenges in our universe. We just don't know. So this would almost be like a sort of inverse of the great filter, but we can only speculate as to what this might occur. But I think we should keep it as a possibility. Um, so, um, I mean, certainly one thing uh, is point that a lot of people have made, uh, Robert Heinlein made this point that a species that develops the ability to spread itself to other planets would all things being equal have a greater chance of long-term survival probably that seems reasonable but again we don't know for sure now one thing that a lot of people have talked about is so-called von neumann machines so uh john von neumann was a brilliant hungarian born um one of those hungarians again mathematician who made very important contributions to quantum mechanics 
uh, computer science, the development of the nuclear bombs and all kinds of things. Extremely, extremely brilliant mathematician. And at one point, and, and the speculation, so von Neumann machine means um, it's a it's a self-replicating automaton that spreads virus-like from planet to planet. So it, it gets launched. So somebody creates it, but it contains programming and pro somehow appropriate hardware that it can land on a distant planet and harvest materials from that planet just, just like a virus and replicate itself. And in principle, one would think it ought to be able to spread itself spread itself exponentially. I mean, even, even if it spread, but was limited by the speed of light. And we ought to have detected them by now. So this, so some people have framed the Fermi problem this way. Why don't we see von Neumann machines? And um, my own suggestion here is to, 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 first of all, just ask a general sort of question. Uh, are, are computers really all that reliable? Um, you know, could we, could we make a computer that would go on and be able to replicate itself indefinitely and spread through the whole universe without any errors or breakdowns? And um, it would have to have amazingly good error correction uh, in its, in its um, system. Um, but, but what I think is more important is that, okay, fine, let's say somebody makes von Neumann machines and sends them off. Um, they're going to be subject to the same existential challenges that biological life would be subject to. They're going to face uh, existential threats of all sorts, who knows what. And I think that they would be subject to the same power law constraints of their spread. So yeah, they're, they're, and they might even, just as viruses do, they might be able occasionally to um, spread, you know, for a while and be successful, but take over the whole universe. Um, it just seems unlikely. And in particular, obviously, if they invaded a planet already occupied by advanced life, um, it would maybe not take kindly to uh, to them. And, uh, oh, so the Vondolian machine says, oh, we, we, we're just coming along and don't mind us, we're just going to eat your planet, right? And somebody might object to that. So, so again, this is something where more simulation could be helpful. Um, I, but I would conjecture that on knowing machines would be subject to the same sort of power law limitations on long-term survival that, that ordinary biological organisms would, would face. It, it's the same problem. So I'm not worried by the fact that we haven't seen von Neumann machines yet. Um, now it's, it's worth sort of going over a list of possible existential threats to a species like us. And again, we're being a bit anthropocentric here because of course we know life may take very different forms, but still it's worth thinking about this. So, <clears throat> so we could list at possible astronomical threats. There could be a solar excursion. I mean, our star fortunately for us is very stable. That's good. Astronomers know that some stars out there are not stable and um, they, they sometimes have mass ejections or flares that could basically sterilize all their planets. Um, Impacts, of course, the very real problem, very real danger. Um, if you're too close to a supernova when it goes off, that could sterilize your planet. Um, gamma ray bursts. So, some astronomers think that gamma ray bursts are a very significant survival threat in the universe. Um, or again, maybe just something we just don't know about yet. I mean, we have a lot to learn about astronomy too. So maybe some other threat out there we just don't know about. Then there's terrestrial tectonic threats. So natural climate change, the climate system is a complex system. It's subject to um, uh, extreme excursions on rare occasions that we don't fully understand yet. Um, there might be various non-linearities in oceanic or atmospheric dynamics. We know that massive volcanism can cause, is, it's implied in several of the major mass extinctions of the past. Um, and again, there might be something else that we just don't know about at the terrestrial level. But the ones that are really interesting to talk about are this self-inflicted threats. Like if the sun blows up tomorrow, there's nothing we can do about it. But we can do something about the self-inflicted survival threats. So, of course, there's various versions of ecocide. Um, 
fouling our own nest, climate change, um, degradation of our supporting ecosystems due to climate change, loss of biodiversity, loss of topsoil, deforestation, exhaustion of fisheries, and so forth. Um, another concern that many people have is the exhaustion of fuel supplies, uh, coupled with the unwillingness to develop alternatives. Um, emergent diseases obviously are a concern, which could be triggered by anthropogenic ecological disruption and our failures to develop responses. Because, perhaps because we think that, that um, the disease is a liberal hoax or something. So, and then the, another interesting concern is the tragedy of the commons, which a number of people have written about. So the, I, I don't, I mean, this, this is worth a whole talk in itself and I don't have time to get into it, but the uh, tragedy of the commons is sort of this idea that it's in, in, in every actor's self-interest to maximize their take from the environment. And yet that, harms the environment as a whole, thereby in the long run threatening everybody's survival. And um, some people worry about this in the context of the climate problem. That, and, um, and it can lead in, in principle to a sort of gridlock where there's no, no, no effective action is taken, even action that would be physically possible to take if everybody cooperated. So there's this problem, a general problem of cooperation. And again, larger than it we can get into in this talk, but it, it's a very important problem. Obviously, another threat that we face is uh, we're still not out of the nuclear woods. Um, I'm old enough to remember in the early 90s when the US and, and Soviet Union s s signed treaties and stood down a lot of their, our, their nuclear forces, and that was a, everybody around the world breathed a sigh of relief, but it's not over yet. Um, there are, in fact, still thousands of warheads on a launch on warning status. And um, and at, at my latest count, nine nations possessing nu nuclear arsenals. And some of those nations, as we know, are very trigger happy, or at least they seem to be. So um, this is not over. Right? I mean, I've lived with it almost my whole life, but it's not over yet. Another, now, there's another kind of internal threat that doesn't get enough attention. And again, we could do a whole talk just on this, but um, people uh, who have done basically what, what there's a, a paper, uh, which I cite here, which the authors basically applied the Locke of Volterra equations for population dynamics to human societies. They're trying to understand why certain human societies collapse. And there's a whole literature on this a question of societal collapse. And the most important book in this being John Tater's Collapse of Complex Societies. And, and one of the things they found is that under certain conditions, the internal predation or parasitism by the elites on the, the rest of the population, it can be by itself sufficient to uh, cause collapse of a society. And, you know, I don't have to say, we live in a time right now of very great social and political inequality. And, um, you know, people are, this This could be an ecological factor in itself. So, so um, one of the things I work, think about in my own research on sustainability is that it may, it may well be the case that a certain level of socioeconomic equity is actually a survival requirement for a complex culture, at least one by species with neurologies like humans. Anyway, the very large discussion. And then I'll, just one last existential threat I wanted to mention just because it's quite interesting. So um, this is Arthur C. Clarke um, at age 90. I think it was probably his last interview. Clarke was asked, what is the greatest threat that we as a race are facing? And I, you, you would think he might have mentioned, you know, nuclear war or climate change or resource depletion or something like that. But what he actually said was, Organized religion polluting our mind is, as it pretends to deliver morality and spiritual salvation. It's spreading the most malevolent mind virus of all. I hope our race can one day outgrow this primitive notion. Okay, so I'll just leave that there for your consideration. And, and, um, and then we'll move on. But an interesting thought from um, a person who had thought a great deal about things like human destiny. So, um, but 
getting back to Fermi's problem again, so, so takeaways from all of this, I argue there's probably no need to invoke a single mysterious great filter. The, the, it's just a dangerous universe. The universe is rife with existential threats and lot could guarantees that only a few candidate species will survive enough of these win-lose challenges to be noticeable on the galactic scale. And it's actually not out of the question that no species, no matter how promising, uh, gets to be much more advanced than we are now. I mean, again, we just don't know. Um, as I say, personally, I doubt this because of Adam's law. I mean, there's just a heck of a lot of room out there. And I think there's room out there to allow someone to have beaten the, the long odds. But they might be very, very far away. Very, very far away. But again, another question, which I leave open, we don't know what the real threshold of competence is for the universe itself. For example, if warp drive is possible, if it's feasible. And so warp drive, as we know, is allowed by the equations of general relativity, but it's uh, for a number of reasons, it's very, 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 very far away from being a, a realizable technology. Could it ever be? Well, we don't know. If warp drive could be made feasible, then it is feasible for species to spread far beyond their home planets. Um, if it's just impossible and will always be impossible for everybody, then no, that changes the whole discussion of Locke's problem or Fermi's problem. Now, one thing you could ask as well about surviving the Locke curve, is it all just pure luck, right? So now there is such a thing as luck, uh, but when you look at some of these examples, it's clearly not pure luck when one scientist publishes more papers than another. They're, they're just better at doing their job. Um, it's not just pure luck if one golfer wins more in tournaments than others. Um, now, what do you mean by luck? Uh, I would define luck as a favorable statistical fluctuation. So if I um, buy a lottery ticket and just happen to win something, just a statistical fluctuation, but it worked out is favorable to me, so I'm happy, right? Um, to some extent, people who are very good at something, good writers, good golfers, and so forth, in a sense, they generate their own luck because they know how to play the odds. They know how to put themselves in a, for example, again, a golfer will, he won't necessarily try to make an amazing shot. He'll just try and make a shot that gives him a greater chance of making the next shot a good shot, right? And that's what the really good golfers do. They, they, I mean, every now and then they can make an amazing shot, but most of the time they're just playing the odds and they're really skilled and they know how to do it. And that's why they win time after time. And there's, a, I think, a very wise statement by Robert Heinlein, who I'm citing again. Uh, Heinlein once said, there is no such thing as luck. There is only adequate or inadequate preparation for a statistical universe. And um, so again, the question is, are we humans preparing ourselves well enough? So the, the a key goal is to better understand what pertains to staying alive. And my guess, uh, <laughs> learning and intelligent foresight play major roles. And uh, I mean, the record of the human species is a very mixed bag, as we know, but the uh, humans have a very high capacity to learn. And that's one of the few things, I mean, I'm an, I'm an educator, I'm a writer. I, I mean, I, I work under the assumption there's some point in trying to educate people. Um, and um, um, human, humans have a great capacity to learn and I'm very hopeful about that, um, despite our spotty record. Um, what I would say though, is we also need to have a cultural openness to intelligent foresight. A lot of people don't like intelligent foresight because it means they have to change their ways. And we're not doing very well in this regard right now in many respects. So why is Fermi's question important? Well, one key point remains. There is a contradiction between observed facts and apparently reasonable assumptions, which shows there's still something very important that we, not, we do not understand about how the universe works. And I think this is the real thing. I mean, getting back to UAPs, for example, quite a number of people talk about UAPs as security threats, or they're flying into our military airspace, or they, they might bump into an aircraft or something like that. That's not the real security threat. 
Um, the real security threat is that if the UAPs are what they seem to be, just saying if they're what they seem to be, they indicate that we're still very, very ignorant about some really important things that we need to understand. That's the biggest security threat is our ignorance. And um, that's to me um, what comes out of all of this. So um, when you study, um, for example, Joseph Tainter's book, other literature on collapse of complex societies, um, the long-term survival of a complex culture uh, is not guaranteed. And there's a recent quote by Jacques Bellet, which I liked. Uh, he says, our survival may not be an inflexible requirement for the universe. Typical plate understatement, right? Um, or indeed the survival of any particular species. So in the end, um, the most it leaves us with the most important question of all, is there intelligent life on earth? That's the one we really need to answer. We're still, the jury's still out on this one. Okay, that's my story. So one of the things that I'd wondered was uh, maybe these other races that we've been looking for, maybe these other civilizations just aren't communicating with radio, right? I mean, SETI has made a lot of assumptions. And one of the biggest assumptions is that they're doing something in the radio spectrum. And you and I discussed this with uh, like quantum communications, mm -hmm. right? It, so I, it seems to me that it's, it's possible, I guess, that there are better, more advanced ways to communicate that aren't as lossy, um, that may be instantaneous in nature, you know, that there may sure. be many different advantages or tight beam laser could be another example. And that's, that's yeah. well within our technological capability right now. Mm. So maybe we're looking for radio signals and the communications are out there. They're just not on the radio spectrum. Yeah, it's just too primitive. They don't, they don't use it anymore, any more than you would try to use smoke signals to communicate with, I don't know, London, England. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> not going to exactly. be a very, very effective. Right. So, 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 um, um, yeah, no, I, I think I think I, I think we have to be very open to those possibilities. That it's just, and you see that gets us back to the the point that let's not be too sure that we that we know all the laws of physics. Um, I mean, I recently read a book by Sean Carroll called The Big Picture, which is a really interesting book. You can learn a lot from it, but he basically says, well, you know. Apart from a few little technical puzzles, we basically have it all figured out. And I'm sorry, but I think that's nonsense. I mean, it's it's just, um, well, we, we, we yeah, but, I mean, we don't know it, nothing. All right, we, that, I'm not saying that we don't know nothing, but 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 um, to say that we have it all figured out, and and no, no, yeah, so willingness to learn, yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of the, that goal to shut down the patent office, right? In the United States, at the turn <laughs> of the 20th century, you know, yeah. they said, well, we've invented everything that you could possibly need. Yeah. We can just close it down now. Yeah. So. Save a little money, you know, and get, <laughs> close the patent office. Yeah. That, that, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, people sometimes suffer just from lack of imagination. Um, there's a famous uh, quote by J.S. Bell of Bell's Theorem. He said, what is usually shown by impossibility proofs is a lack of imagination. And um, now I, I just think we should be not scared to stretch our imaginations and, and you know, oh, yeah, yeah. Look well, at the possibilities. I, I appreciate your mentioning the UAP phenomena so much, you know, and I, I think I'm, I probably fall into the, the generally average camp on this. I, I feel like something is going on. I'm not sure what, and I would say probably yeah. the majority of people are are probably right about there now, mm -hmm. you know, probably where I am too. I yeah. Mean, I've been following UFOs since I was like 11 years old. I mean, I, I remember reading the books of George Adamski. I don't know if you've heard of George Adamski, uh, but look, I was 11. Okay. Give me, you know, cut me a little slack here, but I, 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 I thought, Oh, this is really cool. And then later on, I realized, no, it's rubbish, but, but, and I, but but you know the, it's the borderline cases the cases like for example all, all kinds of reports from professional airline pilots and military pilots who are seeing things that I mean these people are not fools you know they're 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 and they're they're telling the truth they're telling what they saw and and so what is it 
I, I think that's an extremely important question. And um, you know, yeah, um, well, and and uh, I so I believe it's called the zoo hypothesis. I could be mistaken, but that's yeah. the you know the if I remember correctly, and it's been a long time. Um, you know, maybe UAPs are visiting to analyze, but they're not interacting with us on purpose. They're letting yeah. us develop the best of our abilities. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's one hypothesis. Uh, it's 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 on the list of possibilities. Um, I think it risks the problem of attributing human style motivations to aliens, and the aliens might have incredibly different motivations than we have, and um, they may be playing an entirely different game. I mean, this sometimes just happens between nations on Earth, as you'll have, let's say, two nations are in conflict, and each one thinks the other one is reasoning the way they do. And that can lead to some pretty serious problems. So, so, so um, you know, I wouldn't rule out the zoo hypothesis, but um, I just think maybe. We just don't know. We don't have enough to go on. We just need to know more. And um, yeah, so yeah, no, I mean, it is the Fermi paradox. Is it's incredibly intriguing. It is incredibly intriguing, yeah. and in I, I, and again, just as from a layperson's view, the the thing that I wonder is, you know, especially when it comes to SETI, I wonder if they're not. I wonder if they shouldn't be considering more and different ways to look. That's yeah. that's what what it comes down to to me. I don't know. I don't know what those might be but it seems like they're very laser focused on mm -hmm. you know if we search the spectrum like this we're more likely to find something you know another thing that i've read multiple times is that like you've said space is just so big even mm -hmm. study is only able to search a tiny fraction of what's sure. built yeah right? so yeah there, there's um a heck of a lot of room out there and um uh now i know that there have been some radio astronomers who searched for uh, things? You know what I mean by a Kardashev sphere? Yeah, yes. Yeah. It's like a solar system sized artifact, basically, which might be, it would be big enough to be detectable at very, very long distances. And I believe that somebody has done a search sort of within our galaxy, and they can't find any ev evidence that would be consistent with Kardashev sphere. But but I, I'm not sure. I'm not up on that literature. Um, but yeah, I mean, the general point is, is there's a heck of a lot of room out there and a heck of a lot of galaxies. And I mean, it's just silly. It's just, it's beyond mind boggling when you think about it. And, and um, um, yeah, there's, um, it, as I said, I mean, let's say, let's say my picture is roughly correct. There might be very advanced cultures, but they could be in the next galaxy or something. They might be really far away. And and um, even if even if they have warp drive or something, they why would they visit us? It's as um, you know, Amri uh, Wandel said, why would they come here? We're just a little backwater. We're a little a little coral reef way out in the middle of nowhere, and and they've got lots of other interesting places to to examine, and you know, but but. Um, I just don't know. And um, so we, we should keep looking. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I would tend to agree with that. And, you know, I think that's one of the larger values of UFOs and the UAP phenomena as well, is it keeps people looking up and it keeps them wondering and imagining, you know, and even if it turns out to be nothing more than the human imagination, at least it helps to inspire the human imagination. Right? Yeah. That's, that's one of the big benefits. And I think it's something that a lot of the skeptics overlook is that mm -hmm. you know, they're so busy saying this is just imagination that they forget that, well, that's it's important and it's required for us to maintain our curiosity and to keep exploring. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's it's. Um, yeah, I, I would agree. I mean. Um, oh, I don't know. Um, It's one can be too skeptical. I mean, there, there's, uh, I mean, within the field of philosophy, there's a long literature about skepticism mm. and um, going all the way back to the ancient Greeks. And there's some very good comments by 18th century philosopher named David Hume, who is 
regarded as a skeptic. He was a skeptic. Um, so he doubted our ordinary senses. He doubted conventional beliefs of all sorts. But he, um, but he made the point that you can't, if you go to complete skepticism or what he called heroic skepticism, it, it, it basically leads to paralysis. You can't get dressed in the morning, right? I mean, because how do I know I really exist, right? So you, you, you it's, and in particular, uh, Hume uh, thought that the trouble with this very complete skepticism is it leads to basically to moral cowardice because then you you have people saying, well, why should I help the hungry in Ethiopia because maybe they don't really exist or how do I really know they're hungry or how do I know it's not a hoax or something like that? And 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 so so what Hume argued for was what he called mitigated skepticism that. To get by in the real world, you have to have levels of doubt and acceptance based yeah. on evidence. And and um, like, I don't doubt I'm sitting at this desk now. I'm completely sure about that, even though it's just sensory input. My senses can be fallible. Right. But I could be wrong. But but I'm not worrying about it. <laughs> um, whereas what did Commander Fravor really see? Was it aliens or was it beings from the future or was it? Uh, a reflection on his canopy. I mean, what 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 did he really see? And and um, obviously, I have to maintain reasonable level of doubt about that because I just don't know. I wasn't there, yeah. you know. Um, and yet, he's more credible than maybe some other witnesses. So so you, you, we have this kind of um, scale of of acceptance that we have to have for th some things. You just put on the back burner. I mean, I, for example, I've I read the books about the Skinwalker Ranch really cool stuff really interesting kind of scary if it's real but i just don't know what to think so i don't reject it but i don't accept it either i put it on the back burner and say hopefully i'll get to that someday and hopefully i'll know more yeah no that that makes complete sense yeah well and that's an area and this is kind of off the topic of the fermi paradox but that's an area that i'd like to do more investigation into is actually mass hysteria right it, because i think that that's not something that's been explored enough and i don't think it's it's been publicized enough and right. i think that there's a lot more there you know and i think for for people who are I, I guess you'd say um you know devout ufo believers that would probably antagonize them but i i mm -hmm. definitely think that mass hysteria is a component of this right if nothing else they say that something like 99 percent of all ufo reports are are fake well it would be interesting to explore the psychological factors behind that. And I think if we mm -hmm. can understand ourselves better more, then ultimately we'll be able to understand all these phenomena better as well. So yeah, I don't I haven't read a lot about the issue of mass uh, hysteria. I, I knew, and I'm not even sure that anybody knows what that means. Um you could probably find somebody out there who would be far more expert on it than I would, but uh, what I have thought about a bit is is what you might call mass denial. Okay, so think of climate problems, think of vaccines, think of COVID, where where um, the approach of some people is just say, well, it's not happening. You know, that's that's how I deal with it. It's just not happening. It's not real. And and um, obviously that is very uh, counterproductive attitude when you when because these problems are real. And if if you just pretend they're not uh you're going to be sorry right so so um um but uh yeah i mean i mean what going back to uaps i mean one of the obviously one of the narratives around that is that um well uh, the secret government insiders are afraid that if we let out the truth about the aliens i mean then then there'll be mass hysteria or something and um I personally don't think that's the case myself. I, I people get used to stuff pretty quickly, you know, and um, and you know, I, I, I the, you know, the, you'd probably just end up with some aliens being interviewed on Oprah or something. It would just, you know, I, it would just become something that that um, well, it's weird, but yeah. it's part of life. And yeah. people would get most people just get on with their business because they're too busy. <laughs> the the biggest the I, lives, right? I, I think that the biggest for me and this is just me me personally but um for 25 maybe 30 years i've been hearing how impossible electric vehicles are 
And a lot of those are conspiracy theories. It's the government, yeah. it's the oil companies, it's, you know, it's big money interests. Uh, no one will ever allow electric vehicles to hit the road. Well, right. in my area, when gas hit, it was, I think it was over 550 a gallon. I did the yes, math yeah. and ended up getting a, a, a Tesla, you know, just one of the little model threes. Mm -hmm. And it, it it's constantly in my mind whenever i get in it to drive it's like this car isn't supposed to exist it's not supposed to be allowed right. to exist yeah. and yet here it is you know yeah. so and they work pretty pretty well i can't well i probably could get a tesla now but i'm just frankly saving my money for other purposes but it's well i mean this is the problem even in canada a tesla three costs oh fifty to sixty thousand dollars canadian i'm not sure what it is in u.s dollars well, can you tell what is a Tesla three? And oh, it's I, I believe that the base price is around fifty thousand US. Right. So yeah, yeah. In Canadian that would be a little bit more, right? Because yeah, yeah, it would be. And... It's probably over sixty now. And if you go up to one of the higher models, you're well over a hundred thousand dollars for the the S or the so forth. So so um, I mean, the problem with electric vehicles now is they're what they need is an electric vehicle is equivalent to a, a Volkswagen Beetle, right? And um, that or you know um, a mazda three or something like that it was yeah, just they're they're not perfect they're they're not yeah it doesn't fit everyone right it's it, there's definitely a lifestyle match you have to have certain driving habits and certain you know it, it doesn't yeah. fit every person for every purpose well it's the cost of the batteries that that's that's the that's the bottleneck right now yeah. so now as opposed to say 15 years ago now they've developed extremely good you know lithium batteries that can give you five six hundred kilometers right um that's amazing um but um they're still very expensive and they're heavy right so so um they have to have better back battery technology and, and of course the other bottleneck with batteries is that they depend upon um uh, things like lithium and, and in particular cobalt uh, which are in short supply which are um you know the 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 um i mean people have done the math on this i was just reading something last night and it, it's questionable whether there's, there's enough cobalt available in the world to switch the whole us say north american fleet over to electric vehicles yeah so, yeah. so we have to hope that the, the next bunch of geniuses are going to develop better batteries maybe running on slightly different physical principles and Please don't tell me it's impossible. Okay, <laughs> but 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 uh, it it has to be done. Somebody has to invest the money, and um, somebody has to take the intellectual risks. And um, we're not there yet. So so one of the problems. I mean, you really run into this when you talk about climate issues. Is we're faced with the fact that we have to make certain kinds of changes. We just have to, and yet we don't know what they're going to be. We're we're just yeah yeah so you, well, you have to sort of bet on something you know? You, you know another thing and this this kind of occurred to me when you were giving your presentation we're already past a great filter event and i'm not sure if that affects things but when you think about it right like the asteroid that impacted the dinosaurs yeah so it wiped out now in their case they weren't you know that we know of they weren't intelligent at least not in the same way that we are they weren't you know an industrial civilization mm -hmm. but that was an enormous great filter event and it sure. wiped out everything for the most part, every higher life form that was here. So we're kind of a rebound species after mm -hmm. post great event, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, and, I'm, and I'm, yeah. Yeah. That needs to be studied further. And, and I'm not an expert in evolutionary theory. I mean, I actually even published on it a little bit, but it, there's so much that I don't know. Um, I mean, yeah, I think it's true that at this point, the human species has survived a bunch of very tough things. I mean, we got through the ice ages. That was not easy. We survived Toba, you know, so Toba was a um, massive volcanic eruption about, I think, 73 to 75,000 years ago. It's in, in Indonesia and believed to be one of the biggest eruptions in millions of years. And it put something like, oh my God, one something like 5,000 cubic kilometers of rock into the stratosphere and certainly changed the climate from Africa to Southeast Asia. And um, there's some evidence that there's a 
this may have affected human evolution at that point, but we don't know for sure. But the point, you're right, we've been through a bunch of these things. And um, somehow we're still here. I mean, the mere fact that nuclear war has not yet occurred. I mean, you know, as you know, there's been a number of real close calls, right? And and like, um, and we're still, it hasn't happened. So we keep on. So, so we, we, one can hope we're doing something right. Yeah. That it's not just pure luck. So that gets back to what I was talking about toward the end there is that, you know, why does, why did Tiger Woods win so many tournaments? And of course, old age has slowed him down now, unfortunately, but he, he, uh, you know, for a period, he was just unbeatable. Right. And it's not just luck. And, and certainly he was capable of learning. So he'd make a bad shot. He'd figure out what went wrong with it. He'd make a better shot next time. Right. And, um, and so can we learn? And so we have to have a kind of a cultural um, support of learning. And I mean, right now, uh, to, what I see is there's forces in the world that are going against that. And, and um, people who don't want learning and um, they're afraid of it. And, they, and um, I, think that's very, I think that's a very serious problem right now. And one of the things I've, I've argued is, is in some of, my, some of my papers I've published is, is that when you get to a point where a complex culture is ecologically stressed, um, then it kind of, in a sense, goes into emergency mode. It becomes more like people in a lifeboat. And if you are, in fact, in a lifeboat, you have to have a very, very rigid set of rules that everybody follows. And, and um, you generally need an authoritarian person in charge, right? And, um, and then maybe they'll get you through. And, and so, but the trouble is that authoritarian regimes like that, lifeboat regimes, suppress in innovation because innovation is risky. And also innovation threatens those who are in charge. So Captain Bly gets to enjoy sitting in the stern with his cutlass, right? And if if the if the boat, if the if they're rescued, he's just an ordinary bloke at that point and he doesn't get to be the boss anymore. So so um you you get some cultural dynamics that set in when a, a culture gets stressed for ecological reasons. So let's say the weather changes. We start, we start to run low on high quality fossil fuels. The climate starts to change, um, cut down too many trees. I mean, all kinds of things like this can cause ecological stress. And then uh, things get tight and people start looking to authoritarian leaders. And you can see that around the world where uh, I don't have to mention the, the list of countries where yeah. they're, they're moving more and more towards authoritarianism. and and um, and then the result is that the risk is that suppresses innovation at precisely the time when we need innovation the most. We need new ways of doing things. And, but they seem threatening to those in power or they're just threatening to people generally. And so that's something that worries me a lot. That's I sort of try and speak to. Yeah. Well, Kent, hopefully you and I can help inspire that innovation today. Yeah. And I know there are a lot of other people out there helping to inspire it as well. Okay. On that note, sir, uh, let me thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for this presentation. Well, thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure to do it. It's got, it got me thinking about these things. And, and um, um, I, mean, I, I think you have a great series of talks. You, you're, you're putting all these interesting talks out and you know, getting people to think. And that, that's really good. And, Wonderful. Uh, well, okay. Thank, thank you again, sir.